and we are back out in the GTR. Uh, it occurred to me the other day when I was sitting there and mulling over my life that I own this car now for about six months, but I've not really made much content around it. So I thought what I would do today, given the anniversary, is take the car out and sort of talk about my experiences of owning what is one of my dream cars, a Nissan GTR. Now I realize, right, that this is proper peak YouTuber content. I've not only have I, you know, bought the car, I've taken my mum out in it and scared her. And now I'm making a video about what I think about it. <laughs> but it's more relevant because I actually like cars. Those people usually don't, all right? <laughs> so I bought this car back in May, nearly six months ago now. And since then I've put about 3,000 miles in it, mainly actually driving on the motorway to go to and from to various jobs, etc. So I thought what I would do is just talk about what my experiences have been like, both good and bad. Quickly before we do that, I've got to say a massive thank you to the sponsors of this video, Fuel for Fans. Well, I think it was Verstappen's fault. Mate, no, 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 mate, no, I'm Stroll's fault, 100%. Guys, guys, it's okay, chill out. No one cares about either of your opinions. But what you should care about is a chance to save some money on some rad F1 merch. Being the recognized merchandise partner for the vast majority of teams in F1 means that Fuel for Fans has something for everybody, no matter who you stand. And as an added bonus, if you use my code at checkout, which is Jimmy20, you'll get an extra 20% off your order. So if F1 merch is your thing, then you should definitely check out Fuel for Fans. So let's go back to May when I first bought this car. I bought this car from a dealer called Bristol Street Motors. And I bought it from a dealer because I wanted to make sure the car was gonna be completely as advertised. As you probably know, when you buy something stupid like this, any repairs, anything you have to do to this car costs a lot of money. So I was very, very keen to get a car that was in good condition. And for the most part, Bristol Street delivered. But unfortunately, this car came with the very common problem of, I, I don't know, I call it the GTR wheel clicking issue, where basically over time, the wheel and the hub, where they're connected, sort of start grinding against each other in a weird way. It's not very detrimental, but what it means is you get this horrible clicking noise whenever you turn the wheel. I haven't really got any footage of it, um, but it was horrid. And the reason why I'm talking about this issue is because it kind of put me off driving the car for a while. I just bought this awesome dream car of mine. Yeah, I was afraid to drive it because I thought I was damaging either the hub or the wheel. But it turns out the fix was just to literally take off the wheel, put some copper grease on the hub, put the wheel back on again, and problem solved. <laughs> love it, love it, mate. And I have to say, the car as a whole, initially, I thought I had made a bit of a mistake buying this. Uh, mainly because of the issue I said before, but also because I was just afraid of taking it anywhere. Afraid of going down country lanes because this thing is feckin' wide. Afraid of parking it anywhere in case someone stole it or had their eyes on it or anything like that. And I find myself just being a little bit overprotective of what is essentially a bit of metal on wheels. And that all changed, funnily enough, when I was driving down a road one day and I got forced essentially into a hedge by a truck coming the other way, not slowing down on my side of the road, all that stuff. And I put a big scratch all the way down the left-hand side of the car. It's not actually that visible, but I knew it was there. And initially I was so, f so fucked off. <laughs> I was so annoyed. Someone scratched my car, that's, that's horrendous. But then that sort of taught me that like, it doesn't really change how the car performs. It doesn't really change how I look at the car. And since then I've enjoyed driving the car a hell of a lot more because I've gone from treating it like a child to treating it like a car that I drive and like driving, which was actually a really good thing to go through. Since I've owned the car, I've actually made a couple of modifications. I took the car in for a service over the guys with uh, JPP. And whilst I was there, of course, because I, I can't help myself, uh, we installed a HKS induction kit and also a HKS Y pipe as well, which means you get a little bit more noise uh, when you're driving around, which is, which is nice because the, um, DTR isn't a quiet car, but I'm a bit of a yob, I'm a bit of a lout. I like to hear my cars and hear them be angry. So those little mods just give you a little bit more without really being detrimental to the performance tour or anything like that. In fact, if anything, it probably helps the car breathe a little bit better. I hate this part of the road so much. There you go. Although I must admit the Y pipe going on there was sort of preparation for perhaps taking it up to Litchfield and having their uh, stage one map put on the car to give us an extra 90 horsepower or so which is going to really contradict what i'm about to say but i don't get tired of this car in terms of how quick it is and it's not necessarily 
you know, the out and out horsepower figures, the out and out top speed. It's more how it puts that power down. And I'm sure there's been like a billion trillion car reviewers out there who's going to do a lot better job of explaining it than me because I'm not a car reviewer. I'm just a man that lives in shed and shouts. But all you do is whack it into manual by clicking one of these paddles in the back here, put it down a couple of gears and you're off, rocket ship. In fact, let's do that now. Now this is third gear. <laughs> it's a little bit damp out today, so there isn't the most grip in the world, but... Although you're revving up to like 4,000 RPM. I know you guys are probably used to going on the internet and seeing guys with like, one billion horsepower GTRs doing 200 mile an hour on a public road. I don't really endorse that behavior, to be honest. But if any time you want to maybe get round, you know, a slow car or pull onto a dual carriageway with enthusiasm, this is the car that I want to do it in. And I say that because after you've done that very small penis thing, you can then put it into sixth gear and cruise and just sit there and just enjoy yourself. It's actually a fairly decent motorway car. It doesn't do too bad in terms of mileage either. I think it's about, if you're, if you're doing, if you're lucky, maybe you'll hit 28, 27 on the motorway, uh, 30 if you're like sitting there at 60 mile an hour, maybe. Of course, in the grand scheme of things and compared to modern cars, that isn't fantastic mileage, but for what is something that is essentially a supercar, is this car a supercar? I don't really know. Would you guys consider a supercar? I think anything that can hang with the Ferraris and Porsches of the time is something that I consider a supercar. But saying that, it can be a little bit frustrating on the shorter journeys. It chases camber quite a lot. And if you're outside of the comfort mode on the suspension here, which has three modes and the dampeners, then it can be quite a rough ride. You've probably seen from the camera, which actually has pretty good stabilization that it is still quite bouncy when you're driving around places. I've also got to say that I think this seat here is probably designed for an anorexic person because, you know, I've got a big old ass, but I'm, I'm not that chunky. And I find myself getting uncomfy on the longer journeys because I don't quite fit in it properly. Oh, bumps. Now, I'm very much a person that lives in cars. And what I mean by that is, apart from the skyline, which I treat like Jesus himself, this car, you know, I don't really clean it very often. It's quite muddy on the inside. I'm not too upset about putting stuff in the boot, which sounds like a weird thing to say. People get really precious about that sort of thing. I mean, for example, the other day I took a bucket seat for the MX-5 down to Wiltshire by literally just sticking it on the passenger seat here and it was fine. This car is actually quite practical when it wants to be. Though saying that you definitely can't put anyone on the back seat. So I tried sitting on the back seats. I'm five foot eight and I have tiny legs and my head was hitting the back window on the back seats. I don't know if you guys can see on this camera, but it's the cutest dog right now. Just, just poking his head out the window. Get your head in the window. You're gonna get wet, doggy, you're gonna get cold. Oh, we don't care, he's exploring. What a cutie. Something else that I adore about this interior, which is, you know, I guess quite a given uh, given that I am a massive sim nerd, is that all the dials, all the gauges in here, of course, all designed by Polyphony, the guys that made Gran Turismo. In fact, the Gran Turismo 5 gauges are pretty much exactly the same as these. So I'm getting, like, I get a, a weird sort of level of nostalgia whilst being quite impressed about all this stuff in here. And again, this car, it's from 2009, so 11 years old now, which is weird to think. But all this stuff in here still looks thoroughly modern and believable. Uh, although I do say that as being someone who literally just drives rusty shit boxes all the time. So this is anything from that is it's a bit of an upgrade. I'm sure there's any footage of it, but I know Steve had some cameras rolling. But the other day, him and I went out for a bit of a cruise um, in the Skyline and the M2. And of course, when I took the Skyline back to where it lives, I picked it up in this car, which seems like an incredibly privileged thing to be picking up a GTR in a GTR and then going back home in your GTR. What the fuck is my life? And if you don't know, he has an M2 competition. And I think, oh, I'd be interested to see how that car stacks up against this one. And no disrespect to the M2, it's a perfectly nice car. And I'm sure on a track, it's very fast, but with straight lines, you know, it just got absolutely eaten by this 11 year old GTR. And I, it's stuff like that, which makes me really think of you know, Godzilla. This is Godzilla still, even after all this time. Coming up to a dual carriageway now. So I actually have an excuse to put my foot down a little bit, hopefully we won't have too much trouble. So I'm gonna put it in third gear, cause like I said, it's square. Let's just put it into the fast lane. <laughs> there you go, into the fast lane. Nice and easy. And it, it, there's a bit of a squirm in the wet. The traction control is actually pretty good 
Um, it doesn't really intervene unless it really thinks you're going to have a big crash. And then it makes you think that you weren't going to have a big crash, which itself is a little bit of a mistake, I think, because then you think you're invincible. You hear so many stories about people in these cars driving them far too quickly because the car can do it. And then suddenly the car goes, well, wait a minute, we can't do that. And then you end up upside down and the hedge on fire. A lot of people ask me, Jimmy, have you launched the GTR yet? No, I haven't. I don't really intend to because, as I mentioned just now, the car is 11 years old. I don't know how many times this thing's been launched. And if you launch one of these cars and you break the gearbox, you're looking at about 10 grand to replace it. And those sort of numbers make my penis go inside my body. <laughs> also the noise, you know, I adore the GTR slash Skyline RB slash V6 rumble. I don't know, it just, for me, I just thoroughly love it. But this happens a lot. This happens a lot here. Watch now on my right hand side. People in fast cars are very interested in you when you go out in the GTR. They all want to drive against you. They all want to race you. It's one of those weird things where you're almost a target, but the thing about the GTR and the thing that I've realized as I've grown up a bit, I guess, as opposed to being the lout I was back when I was rolling MR2s when I was 19, is that I know I don't need to race anybody because I would just win in this car. Is that amateur for or not? I don't really know, but you just know this car is capable of wrecking pretty much anything on the road. So I mentioned a little while ago on stream that I almost regret sort of buying this car and that's for no real reason other than I just found that it was a purchase that I didn't need to make. It was 100% like a lockdown purchase, you know, like, oh, lockdown's over, I'm going to buy myself something stupid. This was a stupid thing, I always wanted one, and then I convinced myself that, hell, this is as good a time as any to own one. You might die of the big Rona. Well, I also thought that driving something like this around too much was just, it was too expensive to maintain, you know. A minor service on this car is about 400 or 500 quid, a major service, you know, a change of brake, I, I need to do a change of brake discs in my next service and I dread to think how much that's going to cost. I don't really talk about this very much because it's money and I don't like talking about money too much on my channel, but I try and allow myself um, the wage that I used to have back at Hastings Direct as sort of like my monthly income. I used to earn about a thousand pound a month back then and I try, I try and live on that as a rule per month because it's very easy when you get some crazy jobs coming in to go, oh, let's go and buy something stupid and do something stupid. And I realized that was very much against what I just said, buying this car. But that was the thing that sort of made me regret it and go, like, well, I shouldn't really be doing this. You know, I should be living a bit more within my means. But the way I see it, I don't see these cars appreciating too much more. I think they've sort of hit the floor of where they're gonna be. I don't see them appreciating too much more. So if I have the opportunity to, to buy and drive something like this, something that, uh, you know, 18, 19 year old me fantasized about, to be able to have it as a daily and get to experience it, even if it's for a little while, then you know what, fuck it. Why the hell not? And the great thing about it is I get to share that experience with you guys via the medium of YouTube. And this new DSLR camera that I hope you're liking, by the way, hopefully it's recording right now still, I don't know. I always said to myself when I was younger that I'd have an interesting car to drive. So I've always chased cars that have been quite impractical. You know, my daily before this, again, not really a daily, but my actual daily, before this was a Nissan 350Z, which has two seats and is a V6 <laughs> and drinks like I do. But it isn't just about that sort of practicality and having the car that goes from A to B. I wanna go from A to B and when I get to B, have a smile on my face. And this car really does that. It never fails to do that, in fact. So whilst initially I kind of didn't like driving this thing, I really, it's really grown on me in the time I've had it. And I don't regret buying it at all. So plans for the future with this car, because I've already modified it, despite saying I wouldn't, because I do that with every feckin' car I seem to own. As I sort of touched on a bit earlier on, I would like to maybe get the Litchfield um, first stage map. I already have the wire pipe, so it'll just be a matter of going in there, having the ECU flashed, I guess, and then having um, it go on the dyno. But beyond that, I don't really know. But I think that's really it. There's not many more things to go over with this car. I think I've been fairly comprehensive. I'm not really a car reviewer, as I mentioned before, so it might not be the most flowing video, but I hope you guys enjoyed it anyway. It's always a great excuse to go out for a drive in this thing, and I figured that would be a good excuse to test out the new DSLR. Again, any feedback on that is very much appreciated. Also, my PEG microphone here, which I think has been working. 
fingers crossed. But as always, if you enjoyed the video, tap that like button, subscribe, do all the good stuff. Let me know if you want to see any more content with the cars. I don't really know how to do it, really. I'm not a pro at recording this sort of thing. I think I'm getting better as time goes on, but I'm still not quite there yet. And as always, I want to say a massive thank you to my patrons and to my sponsors um, for letting me do this as a job. It's so great to be able to say, I'm going to go out in the car for a drive, record it, and that is me working for the day. It's amazing. So thank you so much. Take care. Have an awesome day. And I'll see you all next time.